And welcome to the fundamentals lecture for our second experiment of Chem 118. In this case, we'll be discussing thermodynamic and kinetic control, and we'll be using a Diels-Alder reaction as our medium to investigate this concept. So our key topics for today include defining thermodynamic and kinetic control, discussing a little bit about the mechanism of the Diels-Alder reaction, and we're going to talk a bit about a technique known as mass spectrometry, which we'll be using to uh, characterize the results of our laboratory this week. And the question this week is, what is the difference in free energy between the two molecules that I've drawn for you here? Now, they can both be synthesized from common starting materials in a Diels-Alder reaction, but one is more stable than the other. And how are we going to be absolutely sure that we have measured the proper free energy difference using the different populations of these two that form in our Diels-Alder reaction? Well, I'm going to find out all that this week. <clears throat> Let's begin with a review of the reaction coordinate diagram. Reaction coordinate diagram, as the name implies, is a plot of the reaction coordinate on the x-axis and the energy of a system on the y-axis. So we're monitoring the total energy of a sample as it progresses through a reaction. Now typically we begin with a starting material. And if we plot a single step process on a reaction coordinate, we frequently see a profile that looks something like this where we have a maximum at the transition state energy and a minimum at the product free energy. Now, let's consider the possibility that there's a second pathway that this starting material can take, one in which it progresses through a lower energy transition state to reach a higher energy product. This begs the question, who's in charge here? Is it the low activation energy barrier, which means it forms quickly? Or is it the higher free energy, which means that the product itself is not as stable as it could be? And the answer to this question lies in the concept of thermodynamic and kinetic control. And in order to better look at this, we often sort of butterfly the reaction coordinate open, placing one of the products on either side of the starting material. This way, we can get a better view of what's going to go on during the reaction. So let's use this new reaction coordinate diagram that we've created to try to get a better visual understanding of what it means to be under kinetic control or thermodynamic control. Let's begin with a really boring example. We've got our reaction here with two different pathways, one faster and one leading to a more stable product. But let's say that we don't give it a lot of energy. We're going to keep the temperature very low. Well, that means there isn't sufficient thermal energy for any pathway to run. And so we just end up with a sample of starting material. Well, that's not very interesting at all, is it? So what's going to happen if I give my system just a little bit of heat, and just and by a little bit of heat I mean just enough that I can get my starting materials over the activation energy barriers to products, but not the reverse? Well, what ensues is a race to products. Whichever forms faster should accumulate in greater proportion, because once formed, those products can never go back to sample the starting material state, and therefore have a second chance at finding that more stable product. Notice that in this situation, I have a product which is primarily that which forms the fastest and not necessarily that which has the lowest free energy. So our relative populations have been governed by rates, hence the name kinetically controlled reaction. In this case, of course, it's the rate or the difference in activation energies between the two transition states which dictates the populations of my two products. Now let's go a step further and give the system a lot of thermal energy. So much thermal energy that not only is the conversion of starting material to products relevant, but those products can also make their way back over the energy barriers to, form, to reform the starting material and sample the entire reaction coordinate again. Well, by raising the temperature to this level, given enough time, I suspect that it won't be the rates that dictate the relative populations anymore. Now it's the overall stability of the products. So at the conclusion of my reaction, notice that I have more of the 
more stable product, that with the lower free energy, regardless of the fact that the less stable product formed faster. So under thermodynamically controlling conditions, it's not the difference in activation energy barriers which dictates the ratio of products, but rather the difference in the free energy of those products. So knowing which of the two regimes is under control is crucial to determining which physical constants I can extract from the results of my synthesis. So we've established that conditions of higher temperature and longer time lead to more thermodynamically controlling conditions, while colder, shorter reactions tend to be kinetically controlled. But how do we know for sure which of those two regimes is under control in any given situation? Well, often we have to verify this experimentally. Let's assume that we run a reaction where there are two products and then analyze that chromatographically. So I'm going to run a reaction at one hour, uh, 25 degrees centigrade. Let's see what happens here. Let's say I get the resulting chromatogram, where two products are found to elude at two different times. Now, I don't know whether thermodynamics or kinetics is controlling the ratio of these products. So let's see if we can figure that out. What if I were to run the same reaction, but this time for three hours at an elevated temperature? Let's say we're in refluxing ethanol at 78 degrees centigrade. And when I run my chromatographic analysis, I find that the relative sizes of my peaks have changed. The later eluding peak has gotten larger, and the earlier eluding peak has gotten smaller as a result of longer, hotter reaction conditions. This means clearly that the product with the longer retention time is the thermodynamically favored product, while that with the shorter retention time is the kinetically favored product. And knowing which of these two uh, each one is allows me to choose the proper set of equations to extract the proper physical constants that are available to me. In the case of kinetic control, I can begin to make inferences about the relative rates of the two pathways and therefore say something about their activation energy barriers. Whereas if I'm under thermodynamic control, I can begin to take uh, consider into consideration the equilibrium constant for the reaction and thereby get an idea of the free energy difference between those two products. So depending upon which of the two control regimes I'm in, I'm going to get different parameters out of my experiment. Now let's move on to part two of our fundamentals lecture, the Diels-Alder reaction. Now the Diels-Alder reaction is a famous reaction that provides a simple way to make new carbon-carbon sigma bonds. It takes place when a conjugated diene, meaning a diene in which the double bonds are alternating, reacts with a dienophile, which is essentially anything with a pi bond that's willing to react with that diene. Let's take the example of the simplest possible diene, 1,3-butadiene, shown here. I've eliminated the hydrogens from this drawing for clarity, so you're welcome to draw those back in for yourself. The simplest possible dienophile, of course, is ethene, a two-carbon compound containing a pi bond. The Diels-Alder reaction is sometimes called a 4 plus 2 pericyclic reaction. It's called a 4 plus 2 reaction because four pi electrons from the diene will be reacting with two pi electrons from the dienophile. So a total of six pi electrons will be in consideration here. And the term pericyclic refers to the fact that the entire reaction takes place in a single concerted step. So what drives the Diels-Alder reaction? Well, what drives the Diels-Alder reaction is the fact that two pi bonds from my collection of reagents will be exchanged for two sigma bonds, which are more stable and therefore lower in energy. So I take my pi bonds here and in my concerted Diels-Alder reaction, I convert two of them into sigma bonds, creating my new cyclic alkene. So Diels-Alder reactions are driven by enthalpy, whereas they're actually disfavored entropically, of course, because we're putting two molecules together to form one. So it's a good thing that those pi bonds are being exchanged for sigma bonds because that pushes the free energy of this reaction into a favorable area.
Another consideration when it comes to Diels-Alder reactions is this. The diene must be in what we call the cisoid or S-cis conformation in order to react. What I showed you earlier was 1,3-butadiene in this configuration. This is the S-cis. But it could just as easily be in this configuration, the S-trans. Now you may take a look at these two drawings and say to yourself, wait a minute, those central carbons are joined by a single bond which should have free rotation. But they don't have completely free rotation because of resonance. So these two forms of 1,3-butadiene can interconvert with one another, the S-cis and S-trans, because there's a little bit of that pi character distributed into the central bond. Only the S-cis version of our diene can react and that's because our dienophile needs to be able to reach both terminal carbons simultaneously in order for the reaction to happen in a concerted process. So here on the S-cis diene it's simple enough. But when we try to react the same dienophile with the S-trans we discover that it simply can't reach all the necessary locations at the same time, which means our concerted deals alder reaction can't take place. In lab this week, we'll be looking at the reaction between maleic anhydride and cyclopentadiene. Cyclopentadiene will be acting as the diene, of course, and maleic anhydride will be our dienophile. This solves the problem of the S-cis-S-trans uh, configurational change slowing down our Diels-Alder reaction because cyclopentadiene is locked into a cisoid conformation. However, this comes with a new consideration, and that is that when maleic anhydride comes in and reacts with cyclopentadiene, it can do so from one of two different orientations. The one depicted on top here, in which it comes in over the pi system, of the cyclopentadiene, and the one below where it comes in over the sp3 carbon of this cyclopentadiene. Depending upon which approach is taken by our dienophile, we either have a product where the new adduct is directly above the double bond, or the new adduct is on the opposing side of the double bond, right above the sp3 CHs. So clearly what we've got here are two different stereoisomers of the same product compound. The first one above is the product of what we call a synendo addition, and the second one below the product of a syn exo addition. So we have two different pathways that can be taken by the same two reagents to form different products from one another. So the goal of our experiment this week is to determine the free energy difference between the two potential products of this reaction between maleic anhydride and cyclopentadiene. How are we going to accomplish this? Well, clearly we need to come up with a situation in which we are under thermodynamic control so that we can compare the free energy difference between the products and ignore the activation energy barrier differences in those two pathways because our goal is to determine free energy. <clears throat> As a final consideration, let's discuss a new technique for characterizing organic molecules. We're going to discuss mass spectrometry. Now, all mass spectrometry experiments require an ionized sample. And for small molecules, one of the best methods to accomplish this is what's known as electron impact ionization, where a high energy electron impacts the molecule and knocks a second electron out of its cloud. So in this technique, we have a gas phase molecule, which has an electron cloud, and we're going to strike it with a high energy electron. Now when that takes place, one of the electrons from the cloud of the molecule can be ejected, resulting in the formation of a radical cation. But radical cations aren't terribly stable, and when they're being smacked around with high energy electrons, they have a tendency to fragment. And in doing so, create one fragment which contains the radical, and one fragment which carries with it the positive charge 
that was given to that molecule during the electron impact. This fragmentation is going to prove critical in a few moments here when we discuss mass spectra. But remember that this ionization and fragmentation process when we're running mass spectrometry isn't taking place one molecule at a time. It's happening on large collections of molecules which can fragment in a number of different ways. So we end up with a collection of molecular ions and fragments of those molecular ions which have different masses. Mass spectrometry attempts to take advantage of this ionization and fragmentation process by separating and counting ions by mass. So if we were to simply direct a gas phase sample of our molecules through an ionizer, we would expect to create a beam of ions. Well, this is not going to help us very much because we're not separating them in space. They're simply flying through space as a random collection of ions of certain sizes. So we have to come up with a way to separate these ions by mass. This is accomplished using a magnetic field. When we apply a magnetic field, physics tells us that charged particles moving through that field will experience a certain force. And because force is equal to mass times acceleration, the acceleration of our particles should be equal to the force they experience divided by their mass. And because they're all experiencing exactly the same force, acceleration should be proportional to the reciprocal of mass. In other words, lighter ions will curve more in the magnetic field. Heavier ions, their path was going to curve less. So they will ultimately be separated in space from one another. And the mass spectrometer simply looks for these ions in specific locations coming out of the mass analyzer. And when it finds them, it tells us exactly how many came out. So now that we're familiar with the process of ionization and fragmentation and how a mass spectrometer sorts these ions by mass, let's take a look at a more realistic example. Let's take a look at the molecule of pentane. Of course, pentane has an electron cloud. And that electron cloud, when struck by a high energy electron, can be affected in the sense that one of its electrons can be knocked out. And it's the ejection of one of those electrons which creates a radical cation. Now I've shown it here with the structure drawn parenthetically with the radical and cation outside of the parenthesis. And I've done this because we don't really know where that unpaired electron is within the molecule. It could be anywhere at the moment. Now let's consider how this pentane radical cation might fragment along its carbon-carbon bonds. We'll begin with one of the external carbon-carbon bonds. Fragmentation tends to take place in a homolytic bond cleavage, meaning that one electron goes to each side of the breaking bond. This means that one side of the breaking bond will get the radical while the other will get the positive charge. So in this example, I'll place the radical on the methyl and the positive charge on the butyl fractions of the molecule. Now it's the relative stability of these radicals and cations which is going to determine exactly how much of each one will form during a fragmentation process. So let's finish up our discussion by trying to predict what the mass spectrum of a pentane molecule might look like. We'll start, of course, with the molecular radical cation, which has a mass of 72. And because it has a charge of 1, the term Z in M over Z is equal to 1. So I expect to see a peak at 72. But it's possible for fragmentation to take place. If it takes place at the external bond, we have a potential pair, which would be a methyl radical, and a butyl cation. That would give us an M over Z ion of 57. But I could also have a situation where I create a butyl radical and a methyl cation, which would result in a peak at 15. Similarly, an internal carbon-carbon bond may break. And if that happens, I could get two other connections or two other permutations, either an ethyl radical and a propyl cation, 
creating a mass of 43, or a propyl radical and an ethyl cation, creating a peak with an m over z of 29. So I expect my mass spectrum to have peaks at 72, 57, 15, 43, and 29. And when I look at the mass spectrum of pentane, that in fact is exactly what I see. 15, 29, 43, 57, and 72, along with some close by neighbors that are created by the presence of deuterium and carbon-13 isotopes. But you'll notice that the intensities of the peaks are not all the same. And there's a very good reason for this. Remember, we talked about how it's the relative stability of the radical and cation pair in a fragmentation process that determines how much of that fragment will be present. So, in situations where we created a methyl radical or methyl cation, which is of lower stability, we see smaller peaks, as in the 15 and 57 peaks. Whereas, those fragmentation processes which created primary radicals and primary cations led to larger peaks at 29 and 43. And in the case of pentane, it fragments fairly well, meaning that the molecular ion is actually one of the smaller peaks in the spectrum at 72. So I've been able to predict not only which peaks will be present in the mass spectrum, but which should be the largest in the mass spectrum based upon the stability of the fragments that have been created. This is the power of mass spectrometry. It gives us a fingerprint with which to characterize organic molecules. So let's sum up what we've talked about during this fundamentals lecture. We discussed thermodynamic and kinetic control. Situations in which two pathways exist, one fast but one to a more stable product. We talked about how time and heat favor having thermodynamics in charge, and how in situations like this we can get information about the relative free energies of products formed in reactions with multiple pathways. Then we talked about Diels-Alder reactions, a technique allowing us to make carbon-carbon single bonds. How they're called 4 plus 2 reactions because they involve 4 pi electrons from a diene and 2 from a dienophile, in which we exchange two pi bonds to form two sigma bonds in an enthalpically driven reaction. Next we talked about mass spectrometry. How we can ionize molecules with electron impact, causing them to fragment in predictable ways, leading to fingerprints that allow us to characterize molecules using the mass spectra that we collect. Our task this week will involve all three of these very important concepts. So now that we have our fundamentals in place, let's talk about the goals for this week. Our first goal in lab will be to synthesize the Diels-Alder product from maleic anhydride and cyclopentadiene under kinetically controlling conditions. We'll then determine the relative rates of the two pathways under those conditions using GCMS. Next, we'll synthesize the Diels-Alder product from the same two starting materials, but this time under thermodynamically controlling conditions. And again, we'll use GCMS to determine the free energy difference between the two possible isomers of the product. So using the chromatograms generated by the GC portion of our GCMS experiment, we'll be able to tell exactly how much of each product is forming under each set of conditions. I'll see you in the lab for all of this later in the week, and your TAs will see you on Monday for your recitation to discuss exactly how you're going to accomplish these four goals.